what do you think about Arc Investment uh, and Kathy, Kathy Wood? Woods? Yeah. I mean, it's a it's an interesting fund. I think Kathy is very, very smart. I know I know she knows her game. Um, they their overall investment thesis is, uh, you know, radical enough to where I think that they will look like geniuses when their overall stock is trading where it could potentially be in the future. But when it draws down, she gets a lot of a lot of criticism. Um, ultimately, I think they've been consistent with their approach, but I don't know enough about their entire approach um, that isn't, you know, public to to have a commentary on, you know, sort of their thesis or the, or or um, their investment strategy. What I can tell is that Kathy is and and their team is willing to make big bets on things that are are volatile, which means there's going to be some pretty big variance in their returns too, which is reflected in their price. I watch every one of uh, Kathy Wood's um, monthly recaps of the market, mm -hmm. um, which I'm like, okay, not very impressed by, but I'm like, like that she, she does them. Um, and then I look at uh, <laughs> sometimes they put on these events where their analysts are talking about their their thesis, and I have yet to see one that I like, like the, that their delivery, the the delivery of what they're saying. Mm. It all seems very like. Um, I mean, I've seen things on Wall Street bets that I find more articulate, more convincing. Um, but then I remember, I tell myself, I, I look around and I go, the widely successful people are not the most eloquent and the most uh, uh, detailed. And like it, this, uh, uh, I tell my kids all the time, hard work does not equal success. Smart work equal success with a measure of luck you have to be around and willing to take a, a big hit when the those opportunities um uh, occur that's where you knock it out of the park mm -hmm. because you're not going to um uh it, it doesn't matter how good of a doctor you are if you're just doing your practice you're not going to get a, to a billion dollars that's not going to happen you're not going to become a billionaire that way and you look at that and you look at a twitch streamer making a hundred thousand dollars per month you go, okay, I got to get out of this idea that I got to listen to experts and what they think and their opinions and all that sort of thing. I got to look at people who are taking big swings and then ride on that big swing with a position that I could feel comfortable losing. And this is where understanding options completely changed my point of view. I, I wish I had really picked on it sooner. Uh, mm -hmm. Nassim Taleb um, uh, came to his wealth through through options, I believe, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, once I really wrap my head around it and you start measuring things, you start looking at things in terms of um, premium implied volatility and potential payout, then some of these bets, where I know you were saying they're, they're uh, I, I sound contrarian, but when do you buy an option? You buy an option when the IV is low, when you're, you're paying uh, a, a low premium for that IV, when you're buying it at a discount. Right. That's the only time the option is really worth it for you, unless you're looking to exercise that option at the higher price and blah, 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 in order to get the other line or to protect yourself. Other than that, you want to get it when everyone goes, this is ridiculous. This is, why would I ever do that? And the difference between some of these things like um, uh, ARC and Tesla and NVIDIA and all these, not, actually not NVIDIA, but uh, some of these uh, beaten down stocks, uh, these potentially value stocks within the space, is that you get uh, crypto. That's the other one I was thinking about. It's essentially an option that never expires. It just never expires. So as long as I'm, I'm putting money that I, I, I uh, that I can lose, to have a never ex a never expiring um, option that has, you know, quote unquote infinite upside. I go, mm -hmm. oh my god, why? Th then you're like, wait, why am I not taking this bet? I, I don't have ever been in a situation where you buy options for like ten cent options and sell them for ten dollars each, and you're like, what? I'll take that bet all day long. How did I? How? Why are these options ten cents? Why wouldn't anyone not take this bet? Mm -hmm. Um. And so that's how I see these things. And the more the more questions there are behind the thesis, where the question isn't whether, where, where the concern is, hey, it seems like a big gamble. They may not succeed. Uh, if they did, it'd be great. But if they don't, where if it's not, it's not like they're a scam. 
right? They're they're a Ponzi scheme or like um, the SPAC mania that happened in um, in 2020, 2021, where every SPAC was coming out and I'm going to get the IPO thing and I'm going to make tons of money. And also, those, what is it, 90% of those SPACs, 95% of those SPACs fell down to nothing. And those were pump and dump schemes. Well, that's not what Kathy Wood is doing. Like, say what you will about her. That's not what she's doing. She's not mm -hmm. pumping and dumping anything. Uh, if in fact she might be one of the worst, I think, spokesmen for some of these things, <laughs> the way that she goes about it. <clears throat> and you're like, you're almost like, well, I think how about you not say anything about my my stock? Because I'd rather not have that stain around it. Then I go, no, this is th this I'll take her thing over Chamath Palapatia's uh <laughs> pitches on some of his things. I go, because they'll openly say on all in podcasts like uh They'll, they'll openly talk about pumping and dumping in a sense. I'll openly mm. talk, hey, I'm going to be selling into the retail crowd and their exit strategy. She's not, Kathy Wood's not talking about her exit strategy as getting a bunch of people into the, her exit strategy. I think the world is going to be drastically different for the better over the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah, yeah I think like that. <clears throat> I think that the 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 main, I think the main approach that Kathy and the team are taking with ARC Innovation ETF is that it's an actively, it's an actively managed big bet ETF, right? Which means that her results are going to be all over the map because a lot of the investments that they make under the fund are, you know, big bets. And the the way that her performance will be measured is, of course, going to be over the long run. But I see this all the time. Many ETFs get a lot of flack and a lot of negative feedback when they're drawn down past, you know, that 20% mark. And obviously, ARC is down pretty far. But when they're doing well, they're suddenly geniuses. And it, that's always going to be the case. Like everybody's performance is always going to be measured by kind of where they are right now, rather than the compound annual growth rate of those returns over the long run. Um, what, I, what I do want to point out, though, is like I read this really great book recently uh, called The Incredible Shrinking Alpha. And it's uh, it's a fantastic book to read around the concept of how difficult it is to be an active manager today versus 50 years ago. And over time, the amount of alpha that can be generated from the market relative to benchmark returns like the S&P 500 uh, is, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because the competition for that alpha is growing in space. People are becoming smarter. People are more capable. There's more data available. And as we all sort of try to crowd in on these opportunities, the availability of great big wins becomes harder and harder. What I find interesting about ARC is that one of the points that the book makes is that in, in many cases where you see alpha show up in the market because of stock selection, that is true alpha. But when you see outsized returns from other active investors, it likely shows up in the form of just taking more risk. So it's not that you've generated alpha, it's that you're just getting rewarded for taking more risks, right? So <clears throat> I think many of the returns that we see from like ARK Innovation Fund over the long run are going to be in that second category where simply they're, they've decided we're just going to take bigger bets. We're okay with larger drawdowns. And as long as our investors are comfortable with the volatility of these returns, then we hope to make the best selections of what we think will have gigantic upside relative to the risk. So is that the sort of thing that you're finding yourself gravitating to? These, uh, the not the alpha play, but the potentially outsized gains because of these other dynamics? Is that something you're looking for or you avoid it? I mean, I, <clears throat> I personally have a higher risk tolerance than most people. So I'm willing to expose myself to more volatile long, uh, a more volatile long portfolio, you know, mostly in like XLK and uh, I'm fine holding the cues or even adding a little leverage to my longs as well. The way I protect myself from that volatility though, is through options and futures. And that's the whole long, you know, always long, sometimes short strategy we've discussed. Uh, so yes, because I'm willing to actively manage my positions um, and, and I am willing to play the game of trying to time the market, uh, I'm comfortable with more volatile investments. I don't personally have ARC in my portfolio, but I do find it, you know, that it's taking that similar approach. You know, they're trying to take bigger bets that have more volatility. I find it very difficult, and I'll end on this, but I find it very difficult to... Um... To dissuade, I almost feel like it's a risk 
to not participate in markets. I don't know if you feel the same way because yeah. especially for the, uh, so for the average person, cost. exactly. So someone who's just like not, they're not interested in the retail trading space at all. They're not like in it the way that we're talking about it. Um, when I see my friends or family uh, spend some of the money that they that they do on certain things that I know won't bring them anything, <laughs> right? The, it, I know they're not going to get anything. Um, uh, they're going to forget that event or that meal or whatever afterwards. Sometimes I feel like uh, in the same way that I would tell a friend who's drinking too much, hey, maybe just like not so many beers. I would tell another friend, maybe just buy a few hundred dollars worth of X, Y, or Z. You know, uh, maybe just do that because you're willing to lose it anyway, and we might be cheering. Um, uh, you, you might actually be opening yourself up to um, to the gains you, you might not be uh, realizing. I almost feel like it's a disservice not to have these, I'm not saying specifically ARK or crypto or anything like that, but not to have some of these assets that could be these home runs um, inside your inside your portfolio, inside your holdings, whether you're a retail For trader sure. or just a, a regular retail blow. I, I think that was my feeling about uh, tech in general. There's a lot of conversation right now around the concentration risk that's showing up in the major ETFs like the Qs and um, XLK. And we've never had this large of concentration from the top five or top seven companies. You know, they're calling it the MAG5 or the MAG7. And <clears throat> I'm not concerned about that. That's that's the type of upside that we're talking about here. I don't think anybody could have anticipated five years ago that NVIDIA would have launched into the stratosphere the way it has recently. And that type of upside uh, risk or that that uh, you know melting up uh, uh, benefit that we're talking about is the kind of thing that you get rewarded for when you've decided to expose yourself to those opportunities. That's exactly why I place those bets in those areas because I have no idea which tech company is going to launch. You know, I had no idea Apple was going to gain 6% in a day just from incorporating ChatGPT into their platform. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very happy that I've got exposure to Apple through XLK. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, those, uh, I, I think to your point, like there, there's no reason not to take those bets if you're willing to take the additional risk. I will mention that uh, Beth Kindig from uh, she's a CEO and lead uh, tech analyst from IO Fund. Um, she was talking about Nvidia uh, when it was much lower. Actually, she's been talking about it for years that this mm -hmm. um, this would be her play. And uh, my God, she nailed that trade <laughs> so Good perfectly. I was like, wow, she did a great job. But other than her, like I did not hear anybody else. And I'm voracious consumer of uh, of. Um, uh, retail trading news uh, mm -hmm. and all these different fields for for years now so shout out to her